what to expect and what I'm doing, why I'm doing this. Um, so basically, I found myself like pretty frustrated at a lot of our conversations. I always feel like it's like, well, this thing's a problem and that thing's a problem and all this stuff, but I feel like we're not sometimes uh, tying together the systemic underpinnings of all these problems that we see at the surface level. So oftentimes we're talking about current events, we're talking about this thing's bad, that thing's bad, but I really want to put it all into context because I think that's part of our uh, flaw as a culture that we decontextualize things. So I want to bring it all into context. Um, so another thing about it is that I want to like deepen our analyses to a philosophical level. Um, and so when we get down to like the philosophies that are the underpinnings of our society, I have this little diagram here, it's the wheel of reality. So this is current events, this is a one layer foundation below that, one layer foundation below that, and these are the philosophies that uphold them. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, as we get through an interview, this is um, our friend Thomas Hobbes. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> brought them to the future just for you, um, just so they could defend their, or not, I mean, let's see if they're true philosophers, if they want to change their minds. Um, but we have Thomas Hobbes right here, we got our friend John Locke, I think we're on the <laughs> and Adam Smith, uh, his hand is visible this time, that one is not, but, uh, okay, let's get more time. Okay, so that's, they're all philosophers. They're moral philosophers. They're also kind of branched out into a lot of other things. But I'm also a philosopher, and I'm modern, so I'm going to try to show them a little something from what I learned in the future. So what I'm trying to say is our reality is made up of these, of these layers of foundational things, from thought to these little teams, the way that we organize ourselves, uh, to the, the government, the economy, the kind of bigger power structures and the current events. But if we turn the wheel of reality, we can see that it's pointing from the philosophical foundation upwards. So I want to take the conversation here, or from here to here. So during this, these little skits and this weird free flow of conversations that I'm going to be having with these guys, um, then we're going to be able to go from this bullshit world, or I mean, it could be good, you know. I don't know, I'm not trying to put any. We'll figure this bullshit word on. <laughs> and we're going to go to another big one. Yay! Woo! All right, so Hops, I got a bone to pick with you. And the reason why I got a bone to pick with you is because you said that, um, that the essence of human nature is to be in a state of war. And that we should... Um, we should uh, get a leviathan, a dragon, a big sea monster to stop us from our innate desire to beat each other up. And I just think that's pretty immature because as you see, first of all, what the hell does this dragon have that I don't? And that's what I want to know. What are the moral qualities of this dragon that could tell me what to do? I think I know what to do, and of course you probably think you know what to do too, but somehow this dragon is better than me, better than you, better than everyone in the room to know what to do. And, as you can see, in our current events right now, we might be going to war again. And you were saying that if we had this little puppy, this leviathan, the biblical idea, by the way, a sea monster, um, that this would somehow stop us from going to war. But I challenge you, my friend, I challenge you that, um, that I, don't, I don't really think that's how it is. I think that you were the one to make us believe that. I think you were the one that perpetuated that idea. And I understand that you came from a time in England where everyone was fighting each other for like 100 years after 100 years, and all the, the wars were called the Seven Years War, the Nine Years War, the Hundred Years War, the Twelve Years, whatever, all these wars. And you were at the defense of King Charles I, were you not? Yes, 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 you were. And I think that you might have been, one, a little bit biased, two, a little bit fearful, 
fearful of the circumstances that you were in, and you were just trying to uphold uh, the person that was paying you. So, what, uh, But what I want to know is, I want you to think about what it was like for you when you concluded that war was just our natural state. And I actually think that's lazy thinking, because all you do is look at the surface level, and you say, well, this is just how people are. Well, let me tell you a little something. It's an idea called self-fulfilling philosophies. OK, so I'm going to show you how it works. Yes, over here, my friends. <laughs> it's a little illusion, okay? And the illusion is, so we know the claim, the biggest thing, the only thing to fear is fear itself. And I'll show you how it works. Uh, let's see what I want to start with. All right, and it's with volunteers. Volunteer, I mean, just come up, you can volunteer with your body. Come on around the, yeah, Richard, come on. Let's see who else, someone else, ooh, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to volunteer for this? Oh, yeah, come on. There's a mirror, just in case. Here, for the portable. And when we do this portable, you can see the audience behind you. There you go. And yourself. <laughs> All right, let's look inside. Remember, I'm going to teach you something, okay? It's called self-fulfilling philosophies. Right, come on, let's go inside. Okay. Everyone in there is trying to kill you. Come on. <laughs> okay, here, right here. Take this. Take this. You've got to protect yourself. You've got to protect yourself. Oh! <laughs> okay, here, here, here. Swords for sale. Swords for sale. Swords for sale. Okay. Oh, wait. All right. Wait. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for volunteering. Mr. Locke, 
didn't really turn out like that because it, our government is kind of just doing whatever the hell it wants right now. And the, I think the thing is, the question is, let's see. It's just the same question that I asked to uh, Leviathan right here. I asked, well, what makes you, if you're a Leviathan, supposed to be an absolute monarch, a single ruler that stops us from doing bad things. Um, but as you can see, it still has claws, you know, so it's got some uh, threatening aspects there. But uh, Leviathan, let's see, limited government, um, Oh man, I lost my train of thought. And it was a regular thing to talk about. <laughs> what was that? Locke is saying that we can provide for ourselves. Oh system. yeah. And then Locke is saying that this one person needs to rule us. Oh, right, right, right. So it's not an absolute monarch. It's we vote, you know, we bring like a, uh, a congress and things like that. So there's like a balance of, of power and things like that. But the thing that I'm thinking about is that these are all like really abstract ideas, Hobbes. Like I, and both both of you, these are really abstract. Like what are they what are they ruling over? What for what? Like what what like if I just want to go down here, why do they have to tell me how to do that? I don't get it. Like what are we ruling over? Adam Smith, do you have anything that you want to say about that? Let me fix your bow tie. <laughs> there we go. Okay, Adam Smith here is the Scottish economist, and they're all more philosophers, but you know, they all like to talk about politics and economy and all that stuff. Adam Smith says that it's actually, both of them believe that the government is just there to keep property rights going, so that way we can trade and trade and trade. So that, that's Adam Smith's thing, is that we, our human nature is just to trade. And I think that's kind of silly. I think that's kind of silly. I think that Adam Smith is kind of doing the same thing that Hobbes was doing, is that he just sees what's on the surface, and he's He's uh, calling the he's calling it a cause. It's actually an effect. The effect of the market is that everyone's trading, but that's not the cause. Is that we're just driven to trade. So, but the idea here is this government market combination. Is that we, we there's some combination of we're warlike creatures. We just really like to trade. And we should elect a government, but not really just to manage our property. But all of this to me is really abstract. I think it's not really, it's not really rooted in anything. It's not really talking about anything serious. You want to bring some ground into the conversation? <laughs> Got to make sure that we root these ideas in something, something tangible. Something. <laughs> Oh, it's real. <laughs> so I know you've only experienced Europe, whatever, but let's travel over to the Western Hemisphere. Let's learn a bit about the people of Cascadia. Okay, the people of Cascadia, uh, which includes the Coast Salish, Wakashin, gotta supplement my memory here. There are four major areas, and um, hold on. Anyways, there were four major areas. I'll have to remember them in just a second. But they were all rooted in precisely the land that was here. And so everything that the culture was made out of had to do with if you live downriver, then maybe you might have a, a seafaring society. If you live upriver, you might have to do something with um, oops, with different plants there, and like the beavers and different um, animals there. And the, the trade that emerged was really just limited to just whatever they needed to live. It wasn't just human nature. Oh, yeah, we just want to trade things. You know, so it's like, this is the land that we live on, and all of it is a beautiful tree, cedar tree right here. And that gives us bark. It gives us canoes for traveling and learning about people. This uh, balsam root helps us to uh, cure uh, our ailments, you know, this this river here uh, allows us to uh, feed ourselves with uh, uh, 
wapato and the salmon, all of these things have to do with life, with life and, and what, there wasn't any action that was traceable back to sustaining and regenerating life. So what, what do these ideas, what does this Leviathan here have to do with the land that we're on right now? What is, what's the relationship here? And so, let me see here. So if we talk about Adam Smith, if everything's about resources, why would we just want to just keep producing and producing and producing? That doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't have, it's not rooted in anything. So, what if we Of it, and this is the alternate reality. 
So, I'd like to ask the question, it's not so much what are we like, like, oh, are we like beavers or are we like this? But I would like to ask a different question. Actually, first I'd like to answer the human nature question. Is that we are self-fulfilling philosophies. And that's what we are. So as you, like the mirror exercise, is if we all believe that we are a certain way, we will adapt to that environment and we will create rules and games and systems that are based on that belief, which is basically what's happening now. So, my answer to human nature is, I can't believe that this is for me, <coughs> self-fulfilling philosophy. Um, that's my answer to the human nature question. And then I want to propose another more meaningful philosophical question, which is what makes life worth living? here that makes life worth living.
<laughs> Let's see. Um, pandemic flu, antibiotic resistant bugs. Real stuff. Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> technology, or like, you know, production technology. Okay, so we got a lot of examples of bullshit. You don't even have to step further than the outside to see all the things. Okay, what makes life worth living? Friendship. Huh. Yeah. 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 Oh. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, travel, I'm guessing. Cartography. Oh, cartography, yes. <laughs> that 
intrinsic motivation works, and it just depends on time, place, age, and all these different variables. So, to be British about it, Summerhill School, Summerhill, and you, um, I don't blame you for not understanding this because everything that you were around was extrinsically motivated. The Summerhill School, founded about 100 years ago, 99 to be exact, uh, functions off of intrinsic motivation. Let's actually see what kids are like when we're not constantly telling them what to do. And so what you find out is that in this book, you find out that kids, they start off egotistical, you come out of the womb, of course all you can think about is milk and heat and whatever, but as you get older, you find your interest. So I like to call it the diversity of what makes life worth living. So if this is supposed to be colored, I didn't have a time. It's supposed to be a color wheel, and it's supposed to be diverse, but... intrinsic motivation, you can say, hey, you know, I really like, you know, climbing trees, you know, or if you're like three years old, like, oh, I really like talking about poop or whatever. <laughs> if you're like a teenager, you might want to like go to the movies or any fight, you know, and if all these people are, these are different things of what makes life worth living, so if these people are all interacting with, with each other, functioning off of intrinsic motivation, the first thing that you have is self-love, because as you get to explore your interests, you develop a sense of self-love, and self-love is a prerequisite for cooperation, it's a prerequisite for friendship. So instead of coming up with a theory of war, my friend, you should be coming up with a theory of friendship, which is the opposite of war. So as you understand friendship, as you understand intrinsic motivation, as you understand well-examined intrinsic value, then we can create the cornucopia of what makes life worth living, and it is actually a diplomatic effort that solves the majority of the ones that you're trying to solve. So, the main thing is, oh, first, I know it's all over the place. It's called redesign everything, or solutions all those problems. <laughs> first thing that I do, I don't want to Because there's a crack in the uh, in the hinge, 
We got this little WD-40 to fix up the hinge. And then we got these, oh no, this tool broke off. Oh, <laughs> oh, no, oh no, this is, that's basically what our society is. Our society is just a toolbox full of tools that ultimately have no purpose other than the case that is holding it. So, what I'm trying to say is a lot of things, but that if we release the kids, then intrinsic motivation would flourish. Our philosophical answer, philosophical question of what makes life worth living would flourish. And if we allow the rest of society to emerge from the imagination of youth who grew up in intrinsic motivation, then it would flourish for everyone else as well. So in order to talk about that, in order to talk about that, I want to put to rest certain ideas. I want to put to rest ideas that we need an alternative economy for an alternative government, or we just need to replace who's in the system. What we need is an alternative entire way of life that is based on what makes life worth living for everyone, that is dynamic, that it flourishes, that it changes, and that these games are not extrinsic motivation games, but they're philosophical and logistical games of what makes life worth living. As we live around people that understand what that is from youth, then we have a broad menu of that. And that replaces the problems of war, that replaces the idea of, of getting, uh, taxing everyone, having these little businesses just to do things, and you tax everyone, and then you try to, like these people are trying to get that person to pay for this thing, and this person trying to get them to pay for this thing, and all you really gotta do is eliminate this clutter, all of this, this is what's leading to climate change, this is what's leading to war, all of this circular reasoning that's coming from just things that are fundamentally flawed from the philosophical foundation, and you can allow things to flourish. So instead of having that, we have to elect a government leader who actually grew up in intrinsic motivation systems, so they never even had the ability to develop their own moral ideas. They never had the ability to understand what makes life worth living for them. So in the absence of that, they actually have huge emotional problems with their ego, and then you're creating a system where these egotistical like kids, basically kids, are trying to run this thing, and then you're trying to like persuade them this way and that way. So we have to allow ourselves to examine what makes life worth living, to create games for the object of the game. This would be the game the game section, where the object of the game is to make life worth living for everyone, which we already have examples of that. And all we have to do logistically is ask ourselves, how do these teams function to accomplish the object of the game, which is to make life worth living for everyone? And fortunately, oh, I feel like that was good. I should probably let that sit for a little bit. <laughs> We're getting out of Europe, back to the Western Hemisphere again, Nishinaabeg territory, and uh, presently Toronto. And so she's an indigenous uh, author who was able to create a radical resurgence in Nishinaabeg territory. And she talks about, um, I don't think I'm pronouncing it right, Bing Jean, this child who went into the, the woods just to explore, intrinsically motivated to explore, find what makes life worth living and comes across a squirrel. The squirrel is uh, nibbling on the, on the maple tree. And then it just keeps sucking on it. So they're like, oh, oh, let me do that. Oh, let me do that instead. Oh, and they run and tell their mom and their aunts and they, they all come back and they're like, oh, let's do this. Oh, let's boil it tonight and like mix it with the, the meat that we have. So now this child who was just exploring and pursuing their intrinsic motivation actually created something that was good for other people instrumentally good. And the context in which this, ch this child grew up was not to, to keep producing products or to anything like that. It was just rooted in, in life and what made it worth living. So ultimately, all these systems are just entirely unfounded. And we have to talk about just we can eliminate all the clutter that's at the top and all these power structures and all that stuff and just keep it rooted in, in life eating, sleeping, shelter, which is something pretty easily, I've seen a lot of people build houses, and my friends build houses, do gardens. All that stuff is pretty easy. 
And so that's life and what makes it worth living. And if you're creative, if you grow up creative, almost everything's worth living. You, everything's fun. You jump on the car and do whatever you want. <laughs> and so the majority of our time spent, I would say, is in that self-fixing toolbox. So we have all this clutter just trying to repair these little patches of our systems. But in order to get to the liberated world, all we have to do is understand that this liberated world is possible, that all we have to do is talk about life, what makes it worth living, what teams we're gonna be on, and overall how those games play out to accomplish the object of the game, which is to make life worth living for everyone. And I think that's it, yeah. <laughs>